Hello everybody, uh, we're moving on into chapter 4 now, uh, section 4.1a called Higher Order Derivatives and Concavity. So before we get started, let's talk about this higher order derivatives, what they mean by that. Um, so previously, you know, we've had, you know, a function, y equal, you know, um, whatever it happens to be, 4x cubed, okay? Um, when we took the derivative of that, um, we used dy dx to indicate derivative, which was 12x squared. So a higher order derivative is going to be a derivative past the first derivative. So if I wanted to take the what's called the second derivative, Basically, in this notation, it's going to be look like this. Okay, that stands for second derivative. Okay, that's just taking the derivative of the first derivative, so that'd be 24x. Okay, so this notation I've used here is called Leibniz notation. Uh, it's a common notation. You'll see um, if we were using the just regular old function notation. Um, then we use typically use prime notation. Okay, so f prime of x as normal is 12x squared, and if I want to indicate second derivative, I just have two prime signs. It's called f double prime. Okay, so this is typically the two notations you would see: Leibniz notation here on the left, and uh, and function notation here on the right. Um, but either of them mean the same thing. So a second derivative is simply the derivative of the first derivative. That's all it is. All right, now, um, concavity. Um, this deals with literally the shape of the graph. Okay, so if something is considered concave up, basically the graph is looking to look something like that. Okay, so think of u-shape being upward. If something's concave down, it's basically going to look like that. So we think of like an upside down u. Um, and I'm talking while I'm writing and it's messing me up here. Uh, concave down. <laughs> okay. So in essence, we're, instead of looking at increasing, decreasing as we did in 3.4, um, we're going to use the second derivative in the same fashion to get concave up and concave down. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. All right, um, now let's look at some of the questions here. Um, so the first few questions, they're just asking you for f double prime of x. They're just asking you for the second derivatives. Okay, so not asking anything about concavity there, just literally get the second derivative. So we've got to do the first derivative to get to the second derivative. This first one's just a power rule problem. So 9 times 3 is 27, that'll be x squared. 5 times 2 is 10, that'll be x to the first. Get rid of a negative 6x is negative 6. And then if I want the second derivative, um, I'm just taking the derivative of that first derivative. So 27 times 2 is 54. That'll be x to the first. Derivative of 10x is 10. And of course, the derivative of any number is 0. So the negative 6 is gone. Okay. So there we go. Um, take your first derivative like you normally have. And then when they ask for the second derivative, it's just the derivative of the first derivative. It's going to be the same idea here in number 2. Um, we've got a radical sign in there. Um, we don't like radical signs in calculus. All our rules are written in terms of exponents. So let's change this. This is minus 5. And instead of saying the cube root of x, let's say that's x to the 1 third. Okay, so let's write it in that format. And now we're going to do the same thing we did in number 1. Okay, get your first derivative. Um, let's see, 2 times 2 is 4, so 4x to the first. Uh, negative 5 times 1 thirds, negative 5 thirds. 
x to the one third minus one is negative two thirds. Again, just using the power rule. Derivative of negative five is zero, so that's gone. And now we've got to take the derivative of this to get to the second derivative. So the derivative of four x is four. Um, we want to multiply negative five thirds times negative two thirds uh, for the next derivative. So negative negative is positive. Five times two is ten. Three times three is nine. So we've got ten ninths. X to the negative two thirds minus one is negative five thirds. So again, we're just using the power rule um, on both of these. It's just in the second one we had to deal with that fractional exponent. All right, let's look down here at number three. The cube root of negative 8x minus 2. Well, just like in number two, we don't like radical signs. So let's rewrite this with an exponent. So cube root's the same as raised to one-third. And then you have to identify which rule you need to use. So think back to section 3.2. Uh, x was buried in a parenthesis that was raised to an exponent. That was the chain rule, or more specifically for the things we need in our class, it's uh, a specific case of that called the general power rule. Okay. So the general power rule said you took your exponent, one third in this case, put it out front, you rewrote what was in parentheses, negative 8x minus 2. You subtracted 1 from the exponent, so 1 third minus 1 is negative 2 thirds. And then you multiplied times the derivative of what was in the parentheses. So the derivative of negative 8x minus 2 is just going to be negative 8. Now normally we don't tell you to simplify, but keep in mind we've got to do another derivative after this. So it might make sense to go ahead and simplify a little bit here. One third up front times this negative eight at the end is negative eight thirds. And then we still have the negative eight X minus two raised to negative two thirds. And so that's a suggestion. It's not necessarily required, um, but I always like to, to clean these up before I move on to the second derivative. All right, second derivative. So that's the derivative of the first derivative. So the derivative of this. Negative 8 thirds is just a coefficient. As with coefficients in any other derivative, we can just bring them down. So now we're really just looking at negative 8x minus 2 to the negative 2 thirds. Well, that's kind of the same thing you did going from the original function to the first derivative. So we're going to do the same thing. So what was that? Uh, general power rule again. Take your exponent, negative two-thirds, move it out front, rewrite what's in the parentheses, negative 8x minus 2, subtract 1 from the exponent, negative two-thirds minus 1 is negative five-thirds, times the derivative of what's in parentheses, so negative 8 again. And we're not going any further than that. We don't have to get, we don't have, it's not asking us for the, say the third derivative or anything like that. So we can just stop there. So if you want to leave it like this, that's perfectly okay. Um, alternately, you could take negative eight thirds times negative two thirds times negative eight and multiply all that out. But you're not really accomplishing anything doing that. So I personally would just leave it like this. All right, so there we go. Um, so the first few questions you'll see in the homework are just questions where they ask you to get a second derivative. After that, we're going to get into the concavity questions. Okay. Now what I want you to think about this, I'm going to try to make this as easy as possible. Think about what you did in section 3-4. 3-4 is where you found in 3, 4a you found increasing and decreasing intervals 
and 3-4B you found local maxes and local mints. Um, this is very similar to that. In fact, you're going to do the same work. The difference is you do it from the second derivative instead of the first derivative. That's why they introduced second derivatives here. Okay. So, um, first of all, let's think about this. This is a quadratic function, just x squared. If you remember in algebra, if you have a positive number x squared, then your graph's going to be a parabola like that. So if we remember that from algebra, we can probably just automatically answer, hey, this is going to be concave up everywhere. It's an upward U shape for the whole graph. It's a parabola. If you had a negative sign out in front of the two, then you'd have a shape like that. Okay. All right. Uh, but say I didn't uh, realize that uh, when I was uh, looking at the problem. So how do we go through and, and figure that out? All right, so let's go down here. Um, I'm going to get my derivatives. So the first derivative is going to be 4x plus 9. And the second derivative is going to be 4. Okay. All right, we're going to set the second derivative equal to 0 and solve for x. When you were working in section 3-4 to find local max and min and increasing decreasing, you set the first derivative equals 0 there. Again, this is the same process, but you're doing it for the second derivative instead of the first. Well, if I set the second derivative equal to 0, I don't have an x to solve for. Which means my number line is not going to have a divider anywhere. It's just going to be one interval from negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so remember we tested values. We plugged them into the first derivative to find increasing, decreasing. We're going to plug a test value into the second derivative here to find increasing, decreasing. So I want something to plug into the second derivative. What do I pick? Well, literally anything. Um, the interval goes from negative infinity to infinity, so I can literally pick any number. So, I don't know, pick zero. Okay. If you plug that into the second derivative, second derivative is right here, you're still going to get four. doesn't matter what number you plug in, you're always going to get four. This is positive. Positive out of the second derivative is always going to indicate concave up. So we see it's concave up from negative infinity to infinity. Um, we don't have a concave down interval, so um, there will be a button that you can click on Hawks um, that says never concave down. Okay. All right, step two, uh, points of inflection. Okay, so literally what an inflection point is, is a point where the concavity changes from up to down or vice versa. Okay, so in other words, to have an inflection point, this graph would have to change from concave up to concave down. But again, we don't have a concave down interval, so we don't have an inflection point. Okay, so an inflection point is just where the concavity changes. All right, let's take a look here. Um, actually, it's on another next page, excuse me. Okay, let's take a look at this one. This one's cubic. Okay, so if you remember in algebra, cubic functions like that are usually something like this, or maybe they could be, you know, upside down. But you're going to have, say, a, a downward part and an upward part on these, uh, as far as the concavity goes. All right, so let's do it. Uh, first derivative, 15x squared minus 30x minus 8. Second derivative, be 30x minus 30. Okay. 
All right, so set the second derivative equal to zero. And solve for x. Okay, so unlike the last problem, last problem we weren't able to solve for anything there. We're actually able to solve for x here. So we've got 30 equal 30x. Divide each side by 30. x is actually going to be 1. So we'll put our number line over here. One's going to go somewhere on that number line. So that gives us two distinct intervals, negative infinity to one and one to infinity. Pick a test value in each interval. So for the left, we need something less than one, let's say zero. For the right, we need something bigger than one, um, let's say two. Plug those again into the second derivative right here, 30x minus 30. If we plug in 0, we're going to get negative 30. So obviously that's negative. Negative is going to be concave down. If we plug in 2, 30 times 2 is going to be 60. Minus 30 is going to be positive 30. Positive is going to be concave up. All right, so there we go. We can go ahead and answer number one. Concave up is this right interval over here going from one to infinity. Concave down is the left interval here going from negative infinity to one. Okay, so there's our concavity. Step two is going to be the inflection point. So in this case, um, we have concave down, so it's like an upside down U shape. Then we have concave up, so it's like an upward U shape. So our graph's going to look something like this. So right here in the middle, that concavity changes in this case from down to up. So we have an inflection point there. That inflection point I'm just going to call it IP for short here. That inflection point occurs at that X value we found. So it's one comma something. All we have to do is get the Y value. So going back to um, algebra, how do you get a Y value? Well, simply put, Y is the same thing as F of X. So we go back to the original function, plug in 1 for x, and we'll be able to calculate y. Okay, so let's do that here. Um, let me give myself just a little bit more room. Okay, so y equals f of 1. Okay, so looking at the original function here, 5 times 1 cubed is 5. Minus 15 times 1 squared is going to be minus 15. Negative 8 times 1 is going to be negative 8. Minus that 1. So you've got negative 10 minus 8 is negative 18. Minus 1 is going to be negative 19. 